Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 8D, where we're going to dig a little deeper into doing genetic analysis by doing a more complicated problem, a problem that requires us to think in more complicated ways about the hypothesis that we're testing. So in this problem, we're again working with crossing dogs, only now instead of crossing the Dalmatian with a black Labrador, we're crossing the Dalmatian with a Doberman. Dobermans have black and tan markings. And again, all the puppies are black, we do a second generation, and we get puppies with a mixture of phenotypes. So our first job is to pick a hypothesis that we're going to test. And in the interest of keeping the same allele nomenclature that we used for the previous problem, where we had big B and little b, I've suggested that we pick a hypothesis where we introduce a third allele and we'll call it B prime. So under this hypothesis, we're in this problem we're only considering two of the alleles, little b and B prime, and the Doberman would have the genotype big prime, B prime B prime, causing the black and tan phenotype, and the Dalmatian, as before, has the little b little b genotype, which makes them spotted. So Let's begin testing the hypothesis by predicting the coast coat colors of the first generation of puppies. And that's really easy to do under our hypothesis because the cross is little b, little b times b prime, b prime. And each parent is homozygous, so there's only one kind of allele being produced, little b and B prime, and all of the offspring are going to be little b, B prime. Now, is this consistent with what the problem tells us was observed? Well, all the puppies are black. Okay, little b, B prime can be black. Except, because our hypothesis hadn't said anything about the phenotype of this heterozygote, except now we realize there's a problem with our nomenclature. Our hypothesis might be right, but our nomenclature is not very helpful because we're using the little b, big b, except it's b prime, but it's still big b, symbolism, which we've trained ourselves to interpret as the capital letter represents an allele that's dominant to the lowercase letter. But in this cross, we've said that the heterozygotes have a different phenotype, a phenotype that's not present in either parent, either homozygote. So now we should not be using the lowercase, uppercase symbols because they're just going to confuse us into expecting dominance. So let's discard our nomenclature but not our hypothesis yet. And let's just change the names of the alleles. Instead of B, little b and b prime, let's just call them b2 and b3. So we can easily modify b2, b2 times b3, b3, b2, b3, b2, b3. And now we're saying that the heterozygote B2, B3 is black. That looks okay so far. Okay, the next step is to extend the testing of the hypothesis by predicting the coat colors of the next generation. So again, our genotype of our parents is B2, B3 times B2, B3. And that's a fairly easy cross who's out to predict the outcome of because we've only got two kinds of gametes. The same from each parent. We've got B2 gametes and B3 gametes. B2, B3. And I'll just draw the numbers in the squares. 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 2, 3, 3. We've already assigned phenotypes to all of these genotypes, so we can say we'll get one quarter spotted. We'll get half 
black and we'll get a quarter black and tan. So how does this match with the observed frequencies? Well, now this is hard to compare because here we've got fractions and here we've got numbers out of 33. So I've re-represented these as decimal fractions because it makes it a lot easier to think about the comparison. And now we can compare the observed values with our predicted values predicted by our hypothesis. And we see, yeah, it's not close, but it's not too bad. All three of these are not close, but not really bad. So what should we do now? Is this the right answer? Well, let's go back to our diagram of how to think our way through genetics problems and figure out where we are. Well, depending on how good you think those matches are, either we're here, but not very strongly, or we're here. So this suggests it would be time to keep trying and consider an alternative hypothesis. See if there's another hypothesis that might explain the data just as well or even better. So back to our hypotheses. And this time, let's try the last of our hypotheses. Instead of having adding an allele to the gene we've already been thinking about, let's add another gene into the mix. So now we've got the two alleles of big B that we had in our original problem, and we've got two alleles of a second gene we're calling T. So in that case, what will our genotypes of our parents be? Well, the Dalmatian as before, will be little b, little b. Now we've introduced the T allele. We're going to say that the Dalmatian is little b homozygous, big T homozygous. And the Doberman has the big alleles, the dominant alleles at the B locus, and recessive alleles at the T locus that cause it to be black and tan. So let's test this. First, let's test the first generation again. What do we predict are the genotype and the phenotype of the puppies produced by this cross? Little b, little b, big T, big T times big B, big B, little t, little t. Now before we think about the offspring genotypes, should we be worrying about linkage? About whether B and T are linked? Now that we're thinking about two genes, what if they're on the same chromosome? Well, because the individuals in who the, where the meiosis is happening are homozygous, it doesn't matter if they're linked or not. You can have all the crossing over you like in a homozygous individual. It's not going to change the genotypes of the gametes. So no, we don't, we don't need to worry about linkage. What gametes are we going to have? Well, again, even though now we've got two genes, each parent is still only going to produce one type of gamete, little b, big T, and big b, little t. So all the offspring are going to be big b, little b, big t, little t. And no, it doesn't matter the order that I write the alleles in. What's their phenotype going to be? Well, it was observed that all the puppies were black, so let's say they're black. And we can write that over here, that in keeping with our assumptions about dominance, if you're big T, little t, if you've got a big B and a big T, you're going to be black. That's the third component of our hypothesis. Okay, so, so far so good. Now, now we do the second level test of the hypothesis by predicting the next generation, when we cross these first generation puppies, we know their genotype. They're all big B, little b, big T, little t. The first thing we have to ask ourselves is, should we worry now about linkage? Because these individuals 
are heterozygous and meiosis in them could make new combinations of alleles. Well, in problems like this, you always want to start with the simplest assumption, and because we have lots of chromosomes, the simplest, most probable assumption is that the genes are not linked. So for now, we're going to assume no linkage. This is what you should do with any problem like this until you get to the point where the assumption of no linkage seems to be failing. You're getting numbers that don't work. And then you should stop and think, wait, maybe they are linked. But for now, we'll assume they're not. What are our gametes going to be? Well, we're going to get big B, big T. We're going to get big B, little t. We're going to get little b, big T. And we're going to get little b, little t. And we're going to get them all in the same frequencies if the genes are unlinked. So I've drawn the mating square for us and filled in the gamete genotypes and I filled in the offspring genotypes as well because this is purely mechanical work. And what's left for us to do now is to fill in the phenotypes of all these offspring types. So we'll start with the big B, big T ones, all the individuals, because we've specified all the phenotypes in our hypothesis, we know our hypothesis predicts that all of these will be black, and all of these also have a big B allele and a big T allele, so they're going to be black, plus this one and this one are going to be black. So we have 9 out of 16, because we've got 16 squares, 9 sixteenths are going to be black. What about the others? Well, we've got, this is the genotype of the Doberman parent, so that will be black and tan. Because B is dominant, we expect that these guys will be black and tan, and these guys will be black and tan. So 3 sixteenths will be black and tan. And this is the genotype of the Doberman parent. So they're going to be spotted, as are these and these. So we've got 3 sixteenths spotted. And we've got 1 sixteenth here that are a genotype that our hypothesis does not consider. So for these ones, we don't know. Our hypothesis does not specify what their phenotype is going to be. So how well does this match the um, observation? Well, the observation, again, we need to compare fractions against numbers out of 33. So again, here's our table, and I've converted the um, fractions into decimal fractions. And now we can see, in fact, that we have excellent agreement there, we have excellent agreement there, and we have pretty good agreement here. So our first hypothesis matched fairly poorly. Our second hypothesis matched just significantly better. This is still a little bit off, but we're left off one thing, and that's the 1 16th whose, gene, whose phenotype our hypothesis didn't specify. It's possible that they were black and, would have been black and tan or spotted, but they were just by chance no um, double homozygotes in the litters, or it's possible that these individuals might be black, in which case that number would be added to that number, giving us an even better match. So where are we in our scheme of thinking about how to solve problems? We consider, we got a weak explanation, we reconsidered, we chose another hypothesis, we tested it, it better explained the data than our first hypothesis, and so because that was the only relatively simple hypothesis we had, we're going to go with this hypothesis. So what we've done, we've solved a complex genetics problem 
starting with an initial hypothesis where we made a couple of things wrong. Um, I wasn't don't want to say we made mistakes. We didn't. We learned things by making an initial hypothesis, using it to discover what we needed to pay attention to, used it to discover that our allele names were potentially confusing, and that the predictions of this hypothesis weren't a particularly strong match to the observations. Then we went back and tested another hypothesis that was um, just you know, also a very reasonable hypothesis, and found that it better matched the observed outcomes. Coming up next, we're going to think about how Mendel did his genetic analysis. I hope to see you there.